And welcome to those of you who have just joined us for the Overdose Composable Commerce Summit APAC. Today we're bringing you the top of the line innovators and e-commerce experts for a virtual event. We went with this just to ensure the health of our all employees, speakers and participants across APAC. We've been focusing on the best in class e-commerce technology opportunities today. We're doing the same thing again tomorrow, but today is not over. Here is where you're connecting with experts, with you as a merchant or business. You're finding out that knowledge is power and these guys have the knowledge. Before we get into our next uh, CMS, I would like to just remind you that you can head into all of those exhibition boosts, chat to the team. Also, I'm actually giving away an Apple Home Pod Mini. So I've got four of these to give away across the summit. And all I need you to do right now is answer a simple question. If you're wondering what an Apple Home Mini Pod is, it's room filling sound essentially they're pretty small but it, they punch they punch out sound so they're designed to fit anywhere in the house they come in five different colors they're priced at over 150 new zealand dollars it's all about your spatial awareness as well as that intelligent assistant within it essentially you're controlling your smart home in a private and secure manner if you would like to win this for yourself right now, please jump into the q a it is a first in first serve for this one if you can answer this question which platform today talked about Lisa, the e-commerce manager, and her daily work? You can just drop the first answer, first and first served. I will get in contact with you on email. And if you get it right, you have won yourself an Apple Home Pod Mini. I'll be giving another one away at the end of today's summit. But right now, let's get straight back into it. I've got Content Stack in right now. Their mission is to make Content Stack this indispensable situation for organizations to tell these stories and to connect with the people that they care about through inspiring modern experiences. Their future-proof technology provides this content architecture that works with you. It plays nicely with others, helps your team work with more agility than ever before, and their award-winning technology has been recognized by leading industry analysts as a catalyst for a new generation of digital customer experiences and for its ability to just power omni-channel omni content management. Today to speak to you is Peter. Peter is results focused. He's a marketing technologist and a product evangelist. He's passionate about personalization and content management, thriving in startup, fast-paced and rapidly changing markets and just being a hands-on evangelist for technology. Peter is recognized for working collaboratively with stakeholders to build sales engineering and enablement resources to drive that new business. For example, his partner collaboration, product knowledge, and communication skills have enabled major revenue objectives, including startups to 100s of millions in ACV. Today, Peter's gonna introduce you to Content Stack, Content Stack tell you why they're different, what's new on the platform and why they built it. How can Content Stack power your digital transformation vision? Please welcome right now, Peter from Content Stack. He is the Vice President of Global Partnerships and Enablement. Welcome, Peter. Thank you, Raven. That uh, that was quite an introduction. I, I'm not sure I'm prepared to follow that. Thank you so much. So let me uh, share my slides with everyone. Um, as Raven uh, already shared with you, I am a marketing technologist. I'm um, a personalization uh, advocate, and I am not going to give you a sales pitch for Content Stack. Instead, I know it's been a long day. You've heard a lot about Composable, and you've heard a lot about uh, different technologies. What I'm hoping uh, to do is to leave you in the next 30 minutes with some thought-provoking ideas for how uh, maybe you can see some business benefits from a composable architecture, potentially in ways that you haven't thought about it yet. And with a little tongue in cheek, we call it off with their heads, um, just to uh, give you slightly more um, about my background uh, before we move on. I spent about 12 years with the agency world um, earlier in my career. More recently, I spent six years with um, Sitecore and a couple of years with a uh, omni-channel customer journey uh, product before joining Content Stack. So I've, I've been around a lot of different uh, brands, a lot of different technologies, and I really want to help boil some things down that hopefully are a little bit more pragmatic and practical for you to take away today. I'm going to start with the modern 
technology buzzword bingo. You've, you've heard some of these today. You might not even know what some of the people are talking about when you hear some of these buzzwords. You probably read about a lot of them. Some of them may be really obvious to you what they are and how you would take advantage of them. Others might be confusing. Some might be feel like they're competing with one another. And if you're uh, joining us today and you're on the business side of your company, if you're a marketer or a, or a merchant, you might be thinking about why are they talking about all of this crazy technology stuff? What, what's in it for me? How am I going to um, drive my results with, uh, with some of these technologies? So I have to have the elephant in the room slide uh, to kind of kick things off. I know that everyone um, who's listening to this, um, watching today, already knows that our world has changed. And no, I don't mean a pandemic. I mean, just the fundamental trend in the way we're doing business today has gone from you know, the traditional brick and mortar, obviously, to digital first, and in some cases, digital only. And I want to pause just for a moment and, and talk about this elephant a little bit, uh, make, draw your attention to it a little bit more deliberately, because if you came to the uh, summit thinking about this from a strictly from a commerce point of view, I would like you to, to broaden your, your thinking just a little bit and, and consider that we now have to do commerce, not just on a web channel and your storefront, but now you have to think about omni-channel and doing commerce wherever your prospects and customers want to meet your brand. And you, you need to be potentially thinking about instead of a generic experience, one size fits all, now we, now we have pressure to be delivering a personalized or an individualized experience because that's what they're expecting. That's what uh, your competitors may be doing. Some big box retailers might be doing. So we, we, we have this expectation that the experience is going to be relevant to me as an individual. That also means that you probably have to move from a static content and, and a store or a catalog or a web site that is fairly straightforward to edit, uh, update and publish to now a dynamic experience that might be personalized. It might have more relevant calls to action um, and is really helping both your target customer uh, achieve what they're trying to do with your brand, but equally important drives the results that you're trying to gather as, as a business, whether that's upsell or cross sell or uh, wallet share or whatever that is, <clears throat> your, your dominant dynamic user experience should be helping you um, achieve those results as well. And for the IT folks here, we can't wait for weeks and months and maybe years to do any of this. Um, our, our demands in the marketplace are asking us to respond to changes in the market or pressures in the market in internet time. <clears throat> Marketers want to be able to launch a new campaign tomorrow. They want to be able to launch a new product the next week or a new offer two days from now. So we have to have uh, a, a composable stack, not just for commerce, but a stack that can help us achieve all of these things in a way that makes your lives easier and not more difficult. Why does it need to be made easier? Because the universe that you live in, this is elephants, elephants in the room slide number two, the world we all live in has gotten infinitely more complex in terms of doing commerce and content. Uh, Omnichannel means way more than maybe even what you're thinking when you heard I was going to talk about omni-channel, many merchants and marketers, when they think omni-channel, they, they might think two or three channels. They might think mobile and web or mobile and web and email. But the reality is brands are now having to deliver content and deliver commerce experiences to customers across many channels, fuel pumps, point of smart, smart point of sale, chat, bots, print, stores with digital signage and, and kiosks in-game experiences for buying stuff, smart TVs or streaming experiences that allow you to, to interact with customers and, and promote or sell things. Obviously, you're, you have a call center that's probably part of this experience. And the bigger problem for all of us is we don't know what's next. Is it you know, the, the Apple device that um, Raven was talking about a minute ago, or is it a new smartphone that does something that we don't do, know that they can do because they haven't invented it yet? The reality is there's going to be some new channel or touch point that you're going to want to do commerce on that you haven't anticipated yet. So I said I wasn't going to do a commercial, and this is not intended to be a commercial. 
about content stack, but I wanted to give you a little bit of context. So when you hear the rest of my comments that are going to follow, you have some perspective of what that, where the heck am I, uh, is my experience coming from that, that can talk about some of these things. So just briefly, um, we started as a digital integrator in, in 20, uh, 2007 and very much focused on building these kinds of solutions based upon commercial software that was available at the time. And our uh, founders and thought leaders were, were always looking for ways to make lives easier of our customer. And they continued to uh, bang their head against the wall of the traditional technology. So they started innovating to build our own tools that we could offer customers that turned into uh, Built.io, which was an integration platform, which was spun out and sold to Software AG uh, a few years ago. Later on, Content Stack, which is who uh, I work for, which is a cloud-based uh, enterprise content management system. All along the way with this uh, mindset of empowering both business and technology users. And, and that's, that's a, a very generic way of describing what is Composable supposed to do for you. It's supposed to be open. It's supposed to support your business needs and support both the technical audience, which is obvious if you're a technical person here and you're thinking composable, it has advantages to the developer, but it also should have advantages to the merchant and the, and the marketing teams, the business audience. We feel so strongly about that. You've heard a few um, previous presenters, if you've been in some other sessions, mention the term mock. And that's an acronym, which I'll describe a little bit more in a few moments. But Mock is actually based, is an architecture with an alliance, an industry um, advocacy group, which we co-founded with Commerce Tools in 2020, because we feel stro so strongly about the industry needing to have open architectures and provide uh, brands like you with an easy way to pull things and plug things together. We feel so strongly about that, that we co-founded this mock alliance to, to advocate for it. And now a lot of other vendors that you've heard from are, are talking about it and joining because they see that that's the new way to help brands like yours be agile. So enough of the commercial uh, background. This is a very small subset of our uh, hundreds of enterprise customers, but I wanted to give you a sense for the things I'm going to talk about next are rooted in my personal experience over the last dozen or two or three years and uh, customers that are working with content stack. And, and you'll probably recognize many of the logos on here. And if I showed you our, our complete logo slide, you would uh, largely recognize probably 80 or 90 percent of the brands that are doing business um, with content stack, including many in uh, Australia, New Zealand, New Zealand and uh, other regions within APAC. And the, the thing that they have in common is that they are looking at a more modern architecture, composable mock-based architecture as a fundamental way to help them do business better, be more responsive to customers, to be more agile against competition and pivoting the way they do business, to be more um, efficient internally and in how they their people manage different all those different channels and properties. It's a very common theme uh, that we see across all of our customers. <clears throat> the problem is, if you've got a lot of gray hair <laughs> like I do, you've been around long enough to know that Omnichannel has been talked about for, for a number of years and personalization has been spoken about for a number of years. And you might be pausing and saying, wait, this is a composable commerce summit. Why is he talking about Omnichannel and personalization? And I, I, I talk about those two things because I would um, assert that if you're thinking about composable commerce, it's probably because your traditional commerce is cumbersome and maybe not helping you go to those other channels. So you're probably thinking about other channels and being more nimble from a, a commerce delivery point of view. And I would also assert that if you're thinking about those things, then the North Star for driving a better experience should be a personalized experience. And I would I would kind of wrap up the, my comments on this topic that they're not separate things. 
composable commerce and omni-channel and personalized experiences are not three different things and you can kind of treat as separate projects and buy separate technology in a siloed way. You have the opportunity if you're thinking about modernizing your commerce platform to think about let, maybe let's modernize our whole stack with that North Star. However, there's broken dreams. And what do I mean by broken dreams? So if you think about personalization uh, specifically, many of you may have heard about it and tried it, tried it and failed, have concerns. Um, very common in my career to have uh, leadership at my customers throw up their hands and say, ah, you know, we, we can't do it, it's too expensive or whatever. My observation that if they failed or they're, or they're afraid to try, it's probably because they fall into one of these two camps. The first is what I call boil the ocean and Amazon uh, and Amazon Prime have kind of painted this picture and expectation that personalization can be really, really deep and I can have this really individual experience with recommendations and what to buy next and you bought this, you should buy that. And I would assert for, for many brands that's maybe aspirational, but also might be too much. It may be biting off, um, trying, trying to boil the ocean. Where maybe a more pragmatic, do I need to personalize every piece of content and every experience and every call to action for every individual all the time? Maybe your business wouldn't benefit from that, that level of personalization. Second camp is um, what I call the simplistic or the sledgehammer call to action. You probably all know what I mean. And this, this, it's a very natural mindset for most marketers to think this way because they think segmentation and they think calls to action. So if they want to do personalization, they personalize the call to action. And unfortunately, it's usually a little obnoxious because humans don't behave this way normally. If I were across the room from you and you said, hey, you want to go get dinner and we'd never met before, that would be a really bizarre call to action for you to have with me. If instead it was, hey, you look like a nice person. Can we have a conversation? That might be a little more appropriate. So the, the sledgehammer call to action um, also doesn't work. And I would say it's not even really personalization, but that's what most many marketers think about when they first start thinking about personalization. So if you get past those, you come up with a strategy that, that makes a little bit more sense for your commerce um, business model. There are other blockers that may have already gotten in the way <clears throat> or could get in the way of you doing omni-channel personalization. The first is really what this conference is about, and that's your current technology might be limiting because it's single channel oriented or designed for that channel. So for those of you who already have a commerce engine that's not composable, it probably has some features in it that create a storefront. And that's great if that's the only place you wanna do commerce with that commerce engine. But if you then think about, well, I wanna build a store in my mobile app and I wanna build a store with my uh, agents in the call center and bots and the technology that's running that storefront is probably not gonna work and maybe even get in the way um, of what you're trying to do. Similarly, if you have content uh, out there on other channels like your website, you might have a content management system that's tightly tied the content with the presentation on the website. And again, that's not gonna allow you to take the content from the website and use it in the store, gets in the way. Probably also a technology that's very rules heavy. You're Commerce platform might have rules for the merchandisers to say, if then else relate these products together, if they buy this, they can buy that and they can buy these packages and get this kind of price. Maybe valuable for the merchandisers, but could also be very expensive to implement, maintain and deploy. If you're using that same rules based engine for personalization, it can become really expensive. The next question and probably the most common concern I hear from business executives in every brand I've ever spoken to in the last five, six, eight years is we don't have the people to build all this personalized content. And I would refer you back to that boil the ocean uh, comment a minute ago, because that's usually the mindset. They're thinking I've got 50 people creating content for my website and my, my store today. And if I want to then 
create personalized variants of all of that for all these other channels. I need 150 content people. You don't, but that's that's what they're thinking, and that gets in the way. If you get past all of those and you have a good strategy for those three things, then the, the next things that become blockers for scaling out across your organization, going big with omni-channel personalization, uh, is the cost and performance of many traditional technologies. So the hypothesis, the, the, the thought provoke provoking thing I would ask if you're thinking about composable is what if a he headless and composable architecture could also allow you to maybe determine the context of your customer or visitor or prospect in real time? What are they trying to do? What's their interest? And, and then what if your current content uh, processes could have the technology repurpose it to use on other channels and locations instead of having new content and new content uh, publishing processes, what if you could use the same ones and just have it, have the, the stack use it wherever it needs to be? And what if you as a strategy could use technology to deliver those omni-channel experiences with a more pragmatic personalized approach? And maybe pragmatic starts with segmentation, male versus female content, uh, existing customer versus new customer uh, calls to action. <clears throat> instead of a sledgehammer, it could be the right content in the right moment. And the most important thing that I always love to beat uh, the drum about when you're talking about personalization is you should think about suppression as equally important to promotion of personalized content. And my favorite example of that <clears throat> would be the um, sign up for a credit card when you're visiting your bank and you've got the credit card in your wallet already. Why are they showing you that? Why are they showing you that call to action? They should, they should know and they should be suppressing it. So if you've been to other sessions and you're still maybe scratching your head a little bit, you've heard headless, you've heard composable, and you're maybe, what, what does that mean? It means a bunch of things. One of the things that it means is that it decouples the way you store and manage things in the back end from the way you present them for your customer experience or your user experience. So the front end and the back end or decoupled, whereas traditionally your commerce engine or your content management engine tightly couples the way it gets presented. Um, if you're thinking templating, you know, templates in your CMS or store templates in your content management system, that's because they're tightly coupling the way they present that information in that channel. And that limits flexibility. And it also means that your presentation is bound to what that vendor thinks the user experience should be. If you go to this headless, uh, loosely coupled uh, architecture, it allows you to, to have an omni-channel uh, through what we call atomic content. I'll talk more about that in a minute. And an API first way, API first meaning you can pick how you want to build your front ends and, and tie your user experiences together. We're not dictating that um, from, from the stack point of view allows your developers to have the freedom that they want, which is ultimately why Headless was invented in the first place, was developers wanted to, you know, some developers wanted to do .NET, others wanted to do Node, somebody else wanted to do React. They, they want to pick. They want to have freedom based upon their skill set or whatever's your uh, technology stack. And then fourth, and, and maybe the most important, is this whole composable Headless paradigm gives you the ability to integrate what we call best of need. And, and notice I specifically don't say best of breed. The, the analogy I <clears throat> use to differentiate the two is you could go to you know, the Naval Yard and see the best ship in the ocean as, as the, you know, the grand aircraft carrier and, and could argue that's the best of breed uh, watercraft in the world but that might not be what you need. What you might need is the little speedboat that's gonna be on your lake uh, in your neighborhood. So if you take that kind of model to this idea of best of need versus best of breed, we would uh, propose that you're going to have requirements today and maybe requirements in the future that have very specific uh, needs. And you wanna be able to pick a product that says, all right, I wanna do personalization or I wanna do commerce, or I want to do email marketing and have, have that niche product or that specialty product 
easily integrated without it being another silo of technology and user experience um, inside your organization. What do we call, what do we mean by atomic content? It's, it's the ability to take those things that you think of as content or products or SKUs and decompose them. Most of you that are merchandiser probably already th merchandisers probably already think this way from a product point of view. You, you probably think SKU and name and size and price and description and other attributes of that product. And atomic content is simply taking that that field kind of model for content and and taking it everywhere. A web page shouldn't be a web page. It should be an assembly of all of the pieces of information that might not all be one, one unit. It might be some web content from this system, product content from this system, search content from another system, video content from elsewhere. So that's what we mean by atomic content is being able to decompose it and then reassemble it for whatever channel and delivery experience that you need. So I'm hoping to make this next bit a little entertaining because I know it's late in your day. So you might be saying, well, isn't this headless composable thing just for developers? And if it were 2017, it would say, yes, no soup for you. If you're not a Seinfeld fan, this is from Seinfeld. But in 2022, headless and composable really are able to drive business outcomes, not just technical outcomes. I know it's only five years since 2017, but this whole paradigm of headless and composable has, has innovated dramatically. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about some specific results. I don't know if you're familiar with Solar Stove. It's a, it's a North American brand, and you probably can tell by my funny accent that I'm American. So Solar Stove creates these really cool products for things like smokeless fire pits. You know, when you build a bonfire and you want to roast your s'mores and you get, you can take a shower afterwards. Their products are designed to be really, really efficient and not have you know, smoke coming out. And their products are so interesting that they're growing like crazy and they're grown so fast that they've completely overwhelmed their order process, which is a little bit of a problem if you're trying to make money. So their solution is to adopt a composable commerce uh, architecture. And in this case, it's content stack and big commerce. And these guys were able to go live across all of their European markets within five months of contract signing. 37 countries, three currencies, fully automated localization for all those countries. And there's not just those two products in their composable stack. They've got Algolia Search, they've got Bolt, they've got SmartLing for, for their localization, they've got Dynamic Yield for personalization. Wildly successful example of composable pulling all these things together, but yet there's more. The business results are outstanding. They have 100% independence from IT for doing their campaigns and product launches with some just, I mean, you can't make these things up. This is amazing metrics. 50% increase year over year uh, conversion rate, 60% web traffic improvement, 50%, 57% increase in average order value and 200% in online orders. And of course, uh, the, the tech is performing great much better as well, 200% decrease in page load times. Their VP of Commerce is really, really excited about their success, and he said a lot of amazing things publicly, and we tried to boil it down for, for this slide to two words. He is beyond proud, beyond proud of the results they've been able to achieve with this composable architecture. But beware, there are claims out there that hybrid is the way to go, and our feeling is hybrid is fake. It's fake headless, it's fake composable. And you know, it might not really be a wolf in sheep's clothing, it might really be something more like this. So if I've convinced you that headless is an answer to some of the challenges, um, is it the answer? Well, no soup for you if you're only thinking headless is the only thing that will help you achieve those results. It, it's really just one part of a paradigm, a, a, a new paradigm. It's, it's a way of you know, deliver, separating your presentation, but that alone is not gonna make you future-proof. future, future proof. You need some more thought in your architecture. The next thing that I would uh, suggest you make sure that you're considering is cloud-native, not 
repurposed and stuck up on some server somewhere, but cloud native, it's, it's purpose built for this new paradigm. And if you go this route, your infrastructure, you can say goodbye to the, to the upgrade treadmill. You can always have your uh, tech on the latest version. It can always be on. You can have somebody else worrying about um, its reliability, its scalability, its resilience. And, and why do you care about the upgrade thing? If you haven't thought about this, and I bet many of you have because you're here at a Composable Summit, it's expensive. Just the current stack you have, is, if it's not cloud native SaaS, it's expensive to keep it up to date. In fact, the Mock Alliance that, that is doing these uh, industry research has um, documented that roughly 40% of IT uh, teams time, 40% is just upgrades, just to stay compliant and up to date with versions of your tech stack. That's, that's massively expensive with very little benefit. Just a contrast, again, not, not a, a sales pitch on content stack, but just a contrast the way a, a enterprise SaaS product uh, handles upgrades is we do it. Uh, in 2011, 250 plus releases were rolled out to our uh, infrastructure. That was in the form of five major releases and about 18 enhancements, enhancements and hot fixes. And at the end of the day, customers don't need to care. And if they don't want the features in those major releases, they don't. They can just keep on keeping on, because it doesn't change the way their business is moving. And again, unless they want to take advantage of those enhancements, because it's ninety, you know, four nines, five nines SLA of uptime. So then you might be saying, all right, he's talking about SaaS. Isn't that just another black box where I've got it? Instead of buying a product, I've got to buy a cloud thing, and I got to shoehorn my business into the way the SaaS vendor thinks I should be doing commerce. Well, yeah, originally SaaS was like that. And a lot of the vendors that has SaaS products, you know, if you wanted to do commerce or if you wanted to do CRM, you did it their way. You didn't have a lot of flexibility. That's no longer the case. The, this more modern version of SaaS is API first. And that means you can push in and out your, your content in and out of their systems in whatever way you want. And they're extensible. So it should be soon for you. From our point of view uh, at Content Stack, this is, what, this is what we mean by API first and composable ecosystems. It's just an example of the, the many uh, third-party products that we integrate with for, for customers. So you've got commerce choices, you've got uh, DAM choices, you've got video choices, translation providers, search providers. And the point is, you should be in the driver's seat as the end, end customer trying to build a, a flexible stack and be able to pick the best of need and know it's going to work together like Lego blocks. Lego, great paradigm for this whole idea of composable and quite coincidentally, also a customer of content stack. So we'll share a little bit about their story because, you know, it's ironic. In 2017, they were not on a composable architecture and they launched a new product and their peak traffic of seven orders a second crashed the site, completely brought it down. They were unable to take orders for days. And that's a big problem if you're a brand like Lego. And I mean, it's a problem for every brand, but if you're a big consumer friendly, mom friendly, kid friendly brand where they're going there to buy the next, you know, Star Wars Lego kit, there's probably a lot, not a lot of um, patience for the site being down or for products that are out of stock being being uh, advertised on the store. So this, this was a, a brand problem. It was a revenue problem. It was a mess. So they, they pulled the plug on their uh, original infrastructure, which was content, which was Sitecore and switched to content stack. We're able to move everything over six months ahead of their uh, schedule. It was 2,000, 2 million, boy, it's late. I'm getting a little tongue-tied. 2 million unique content items were migrated from Sitecore to Content Stack. And you can see the number of channels, number of channels and 72 different locales. You talk about massive digital footprint. That's big, really, really big, including the complexity of delivering experiences in China. Again, they achieved 100% independence from IT to be able to launch 
products, omnichannel. They've seen their traffic go up by 200% uh, to Lego.com. They've seen growth in their e-commerce revenue. And oh yeah, the developers are way more productive now too, because it is still also about developers. Their throughput, now 2000 orders per minute, no problems. So part of this is not just headless and it's not just SaaS, but it's also a modern architecture for the way the products you're looking at were built called microservices. So instead of this big gigantic thing that's compiled that you do it this way and that's the only way you can do it, there should be a bunch of little services that you can say, hey, I wanna put something in the cart or I wanna get uh, sizing for this product or pricing for this product. Just a service that does that one simple thing that can then be integrated with other systems or repackaged for a different business process. I'm oversimplifying, but the idea is that the, the backend commerce or the backend content or the backend digital asset manager should have microservices that allows you to use the capability from that uh, backend system in whatever order or whatever uh, parts of it that meet your needs. And you might have different needs across different user experiences. So it is about soup. <laughs> but it's also about mock. So you've heard it spoken about a bunch of times, maybe starting to get a little bit of clarity of what it is. It's an acronym. Um, it stands for microservices, API first, cloud native, SaaS, and headless. And again, we founded the Mock Alliance to advocate for these core things. If you're looking at technology that doesn't have those, if you're gonna buy something new that doesn't have those four attributes, you might not be getting all the advantages that you're looking for in modernizing whatever part of your organization that you're looking to modernize. If you do, moving to a mock architecture can be about innovation at mock speed. And we'll play on the word there. And you know, a couple more examples, a big uh, computing brand that's a customer of ours was able to uh, attack 6 million consumers on mobile experiences and they were able to stand that up in 54 days. Financial services company, because of COVID, they had this massive customer conference that they had to suddenly go virtual and they had no choice. They did it in 40, 42 days. Global toy company went from a B2B uh, business model to direct to consumer and they were able to, to stand that D2C function up in just a few weeks. Bring it a little closer home for some of you and you can tell from the slide that this was either a Brit or an American because we right away said down under in the title of this case study. Uh, this is really about a, a, an experience for parents who are using, uh, who are interacting with baby bunting. You, you probably are familiar with them if you're from New Zealand, New Zealand or Australia. Um, it's a premier specialty nursery, 50 superstores, seven websites, and a bunch of native apps. They were struggling with Sitecore Commerce for over a year and they couldn't get it to work for them. So they switched and they went live with the first of their two shops in under four months from contract signing. Um, and I think some of you might have heard Josh uh, speaking earlier, Josh from Commerce Tools and, and Content Stack worked on this uh, together. And, and they went live in less than four months with the first site. The second site was uh, about three months later. So in un under eight months, they were live with two, their two biggest sites, New, Ze New Zealand and Australia. And, and that was after an entire year of nothing to show uh, for it with a traditional stack. So if I haven't convinced you, then maybe um, some industry pundits and research analysts would, would be helpful. Um, Arena uh, from Gartner, very brilliant woman. Um, she's asserting that by next year, if organizations have adopted a composable approach, they're going to outpace competition by 80% in their ability to launch new features. 80% is, you can't make that up. That's, that's massive. The Forster Wave for Agile uh, CMS is also suggesting that if you're looking at Agile technology, you want to look at this kind of Mac, uh, mock principle where it's headless first, not lipstick. It's headless first. It has the right APIs. And APIs is not just about the technical audience. You want to make sure that the business user is, is equally considered in the way that product is architected. 
In other words, don't forget your business users. This can't be just about composable commerce for the IT department. It has to be about composable commerce for the business agility. And that means the people who are running the business, marketers, merchandisers, et cetera, customer service, customer success, they have to have the same, they have to have equal benefits from the technology that's making up your composable stack. I think I'm just about out of time. So to wrap up, I hope that we're all on the same page now that this world has in fact changed. And it's not just about composable commerce for a storefront. It, it hopefully, you're convinced that it should be composable commerce about omni-channel, about individualized or personalized experiences that are dynamic and dynamic driving both an ideal experience for them, but also an ideal experience for you. Get that call to action in front of the person at the right time and the right moment to get them to convert and suppress it when it's just going to annoy them because <laughs> that's not going to help your conversions. If, if you're annoying me with trying to get me to sign up for that credit card I already have. And Hopefully the, the timeframes that I've shared with you is evidence that this composable and mock architecture can, can deliver massive, massive innovation in a really short period of time. And it's not just the conversion from traditional, it's ongoing. You want to launch something new, it's fast. You can do it as quickly as your imagination allows. So I will stop my screen sharing and ask if there's some questions. Ah, there's one. Let's have a solution on a headless commerce and a headless content stack. What's what's the experience look like as a business user? That's that's an excellent question. And that depends largely on how you, what tools you acquire and how they're integrated. Our philosophy is that it should not just be a technical integration. Your commerce engine and your content engine should be integrated for the knowledge workers. So in content stacks world, if you're building a landing page inside content stack and you have product information and commerce tools or big commerce or Shopify, you should be able to pull that product information into your landing page without leaving content stack. If you have digital assets in Cloudinary, you should be able to pull that in without leaving content stack. So that business user experience should look like Legos that Sorry, are- Sorry, Peter, if you can just mute the background of your screen, we can just hear your presentation in the background. Better? So for the business user, it should look like Legos that are plugged together and, and not Legos that are separate parts. Are there other questions? So hybrid is, is a term used by, often used by traditional software vendors that were not built for the cloud originally. So they, they'll, they'll assert they're hybrid uh, composable or hybrid headless because they're not natively built that way. So they want to, um, it's debatable. You can you can do some research, but um, you know they would advocate that having our traditional uh, commerce engine behind the scenes or our traditional CMS behind the scenes is ir irrelevant as long as we have APIs in the front and you can build your front end. And if all you care about is having freedom of your front end, that could be true. But um, you know, our philosophy and the reason we founded the Mock Alliance is there's a lot more to it than that. Hybrid headless is only one, you know, is only addressing one part of Mock. It's, it's not microservices. So if they haven't built an API to their traditional, a, a part of their traditional uh, product, then you're, you're dead in the water. And that's the way a lot of those products are, you know, they start putting the, the lipstick with APIs on the front of something that wasn't built to be exposed with APIs, which means you only have partial functionality through those APIs. So it's not microservices in many cases. It's not cloud native. So meaning it's not up there somewhere. It, it's probably managed you know, on your servers or on their servers without um, all the SLAs that you would have from the large cloud providers. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. 
so tons of pitfalls that come out of that. But um, hopefully I shared enough of the benefits of moving to a full mock architecture with you that uh, moving to a hybrid is, uh, is less desirable. Ah, is best of need is headless CMS only used for the largest customers? Absolutely not. Um, I, I would suggest that headless is um, powerful for any brand that wants to deliver content or commerce to you know, more than one channel or simply be um, free to build your user experience in any way you want. So headless originally, the kind of fundamental principle of headless was front-end developers wanted to be able to build wicked cool websites in whatever language they wanted without the CMS and the CMS templating framework uh, limiting their flexibility. So, you know, even the smallest of brands um, that has value uh, to, to have that ability to, to decouple the way you're presenting your content from the way it's managed behind the scenes. And uh, any other questions? Well, I hope this was a little entertaining and mostly informative and thought provoking. And I hope you got value out of it. I certainly appreciate your time to listen to me this afternoon. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the summit and have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much, Peter from Content Stack.